And when Arizona passed their legislation, their SB 1070, the country of Mexico put out a travel warning advising their citizens not to travel into Arizona. We don't want that to happen here in Texas. That's just one of many challenges that would that we would face. We need to continue to grow our economy and uh, one of the reasons San Antonio has been least affected, the second least affected city in this recession is because of all those Mexican nationals that have moved here to have a secure life and when you see those people at La Cantera Mall, they don't have one bag, one shopping bag, they have seven to ten and all those homes uh, that the AT&T executives left well, they were filled by Mexican nationals that moved here. So the last thing we need to do is defend our number one trading import and export partner. All right. Well, what are the chances for this bill? You were just up there. How does it look? Well, uh, we continue to bring up the facts and not just talk about the emotions. When you look at it emotionally, of course, it becomes a very divisive issue. But when you start looking at the facts, you know, Mexican people really assimilate well into this country. And uh, where other cultures may not as easily, uh, Mexicans do by the second generation. They don't speak Spanish anymore. They are just like you and I with a little darker hue. I mean, that's it. I guess I'm surprised because I thought that the other states might wait to see uh, how the court challenges to the Arizona law went before they went down this road, uh, and we don't really know. I mean, that's yet to be determined. Well, we're just getting the studies right now as to the challenges they're having in Arizona, and their convention business has been decimated. Their job losses are, are once again, I mean, the, it, the bookings are down, the convention bookings. I mean, it, I can just go down this long list of the impact that, that they are having. And uh, we definitely don't want it, that to happen here because the United States is no longer really a manufacturing economy. We're a service economy. And uh, hospitality is the bottom end of it. Restaurants, hotels, bars, attractions. Well, who services us? Well, you have accountants, you have lawyers, you have insurance people, you have computer salesmen. And so it would be a trickle-up effect. First, it decimates the bottom, and then it starts injuring the, the upper service Let me ask you another kind of industries. question to the gang here. All right, because uh, Louis is, is giving us the uh, here's what will happen to the economy if you do what Arizona did. But do you believe that states, even if it's not the Arizona approach, should, should states, in fact, are we at the point where states have to make their own uh, moves on immigration? Because as we were discussing last hour, this is a, an abdicated responsibility of the federal government. Yeah, I think that that's going to be... Uh interesting because, well, you know, we were talking about uh, becoming another country. Well, we have a whole different problem if we had all that. Then everyone would become an immigrant. We'd have people from Louisiana become immigrants. But I am surprised that we are, I, I was not aware of all of the economic impacts. So I think that's rather interesting. Um, you were saying that um, in regards to the jobs, you have like a huge figure there. Well, it's huge. I mean, here, um, Yuma lettuce farmers lost 60, 60 to 100 percent of their winter harvest due to a lack of labor. Uh, retail sales down 60% in Latino neighborhoods. Um, but I mean, leaving that approach aside, can states make their own immigration laws? Or can states do their own immigration enforcement? And, and I don't mean as, a, as an independent country. I mean, Gilbert, right now. If, if the federal government has essentially said, both political parties, you're on your own. We've, this is all we're going to do. Uh, don't governors have to make and legislatures have to make some choices? I, I think that there, there, there's some leeway there. I'm not sure what, what the approach would be, though. And, and I think with, uh, with, with something like this, you, you're, aside from the economic impact that Louis was talking about, you're also running into the situation where you're, you're putting a burden on local law, law enforcement in a way that they, they're having a tough enough time doing their jobs. And we've had, heard Chief McManus talking about this could, this could make it difficult to, in the, helping to solve crimes because people are going to be afraid to talk. It, I, so I, I'm not saying that states can't do something. But I don't know. I don't know what the strategy would be that would work. I, I, it's the ultimately reforms federal. have to happen at the national level because states can't create visas, and so really they cannot just outsource that to the states. No, I mean they they can have some laws. I mean we definitely want border security. Nobody is against border security at our border because we are a border state. Let me ask you this, Louis. What if a governor and a legislature said, okay, we're not going to do the traffic stop thing. That's problematic. We don't want to do that. But right. we don't want to do anything that will contribute to the effect you're describing of, of, uh, of losing legitimate uh, business income from Mexico. We're going to just go 
after employers. We're going to have our own in-state uh, squads. We're going to raid these places. We're going to go after the the uh, you know the supply and demand issue. Would that be legitimate for a state to make its own in-state, not using ICE, not using the federal government, okay. to do that? Okay, here's the challenge. If you take the undocumented out of the labor force, it will create a vacuum because they will no longer be there. Who will take their place? More than likely, they start off with restaurant employees because the Texas Restaurant Association has done a new metrics, which is profitability per employee, and restaurants are at the lowest because it takes more people to run a restaurant than any other business. Lower than hotels, lower than attractions, lower than construction, lower than transportation, lower than retail. So they're going to come and pirate our employees first. Now they won't pirate all of our employees because we're the largest employer of 16 to 24 year olds and they're not fully trained yet. We're also the largest employer of minorities so they probably won't want them. So they'll just pick and choose the employees of ours that they do want. So now that restaurants start failing, okay, what happens to the 16 to 24 year olds that we have got them on the right trajectory? We're, they're learning how to how do be in, they're introduced into the workforce by the right. restaurant industry what's going to happen to them they're going to get on the wrong trajectory instead of going up the ladder of success they're going to start going down the ladder of success what's going to happen to those minorities when they lose their jobs they're going to go over to the welfare system but if you don't want if you don't want to address uh, illegal workers in the workplace and you don't want to address uh, the traffic stop issue which was the crux of the problem in Arizona what I, I'm, I'm not sure what about what about immigration law do you want to enforce well we need to create a guest worker program because like it or not America's getting older the baby boomers and, and that's something we're waiting for the federal government to do once again they have to do it in, in 2012 according to GOA uh, 52 percent of all border and customs agents are eligible for retirement so if you're a border and customs agent and there's a war going on the other side of the border and you finally made it to retirement age, are you going to retire? Of course you are. That's 2012. What about 2013, 14, 15? Forty percent of all aerospace assembly line workers are eligible for retirement. This country is getting old and what happens is we live a long time because of our great health care. People want to retire at 65. They live to 90. That's 25 years of entitlement who's going to pay those entitlement bills if we don't grow our economy and how can we grow our economy without labor? I like guest worker. I'm with you on that. Okay. But again, we've been waiting how long for the federal government to That's do that? That's what I mean. We, we need to... That takes me back to what we were talking about before. When you've got a good idea, if you send it to Washington, it dies there. Believe Wouldn't me, you like to go to a place where the, where you could have some say and where things could get done in your lifetime? Jack for president. Of Texas. No, not a, yeah, maybe of Texas, not of the, not of the Texas. United States. Of it, Texas, because these are good ideas, but they're going to a place where they have where no good chance. Ideas die. We, yes, where they're smothered the minute they uh, get off the plane. I mean, think about it. it. It makes all the sense in the world, right? You and I have had this. How many times have you and I had the guest worker discussion? Very, it's double lot, digits, lot times, right? Yes. Okay. And it's a great idea, it's, and we need it's it. It's going desperately. nowhere. It's going nowhere. Well, not if any John McCain to would have, were to win, he, he almost lost his whole uh, political life because he was trying to do comprehensive immigration reform, which included guest worker. But uh, a lot of the Hispanics, my people, uh, they, they thanked him by voting for Barack Obama. And uh, that's one of the people that I kind of uh, have been, I was let down by that last election because as Mexicans, we should have supported McCain, who almost lost his whole career to build or to, to, to legalize uh, and, and create a guest worker program. All right, let me ask you another question. New question on the gang. Uh, Wisconsin, what's going on in Wisconsin? Should public employees be allowed to collective bargain? No. Nope. Gilbert? Uh, I, I would say yes. Uh, and and I, have, I have no, I have issues with the teachers union and my mother was a teacher. She had issues with the teachers union. And I, understand, and I, I think that they, I think they have the fundamental right to collect uh, to, to collective bargaining, but I think that uh, teachers union in particular has soured a lot of people on that on the, that concept because they have not shown a willingness to uh, they they basically kind of stuck to their to their guns on a lot of on a lot of things that have not been effective in education. I think they've been opposed so you to think the idea of merit pay. They've, they've they've abused it or they've given oh yeah I think so. I mean, they, why do you guys say no? You know, and hearing so many different viewpoints about what's happening there, you know, um, I, 
maybe my answer was a little bit too quick, but I just think that there's so much turmoil going on. And I think when people say that, you know, they're making $50,000 a year and then they have an additional, you know, year of benefits, I think that that, what's, what's wrong with that? Teachers should get paid. They're, they're creating the future for everybody else. And so I don't think that's a lot of money. I don't understand why they are saying that 50000 is this astronomical amount for educators. Louis, why would you, you say no to, to it's, the it's, EU collective work? It's one thing when you unionize against capital. It's another thing when you unionize against the people and the taxpayer. Because in the private sector, when the union overreaches, there's a market system that will punish them. General Motors, Ford, Chrysler. When the public sector unionizes and the union overreaches, there is no market mechanism to punish them. All that happens is taxes go up, fees goes up, fines go up, and so the people end up paying and we eventually get to this catastrophe that's happening in Wisconsin because, for example, those teachers union, no merit pay, it was, it was legacy pay. The longer you're there, the harder it is to fire you. It's first in, for, uh, last hired, first, 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 first out. That's wrong. They, they have to, uh, I don't think, uh, now it's one thing if it's police and fire because they, that's public safety, but not non uniform. Well, the irony in this too is when we first started having the discussion, I remember when I was in, first in talk radio, this is 20 years ago, you, the, the main topic of discussion about teachers was how, how scandalously underpaid they were. You could start throwing out the average salaries and it shocked people because they thought they perceived the teachers made more money than that. But now those average salaries are actually at a point where we think that's pretty good money. You know, when you can be in the yeah. 40s or 50 grand, just start. And, and as one of you mentioned, it then goes up on the basis of seniority, not merit. Um, they've kind of lost their mm -hmm. biggest uh, bond with the public, which was that underpaid teacher who's eating ramen noodles and having to buy her own chalk. Now we've come to a situation where the, their union has made them look bad. Yeah, I think it's true. And I don't think it's a, necessarily the teachers are underpaid uh, as a whole, but I think that there are, that teachers are not being rewarded. Good teachers are not being rewarded for their good work, and bad teachers uh, are being allowed to to uh, just kind of skate by. And I think that's the system that, that a lot of us object to. And I, and I think maybe it's there's been a tendency to want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because I think a lot of us are very frustrated with the way they've handled things. But you know, I, when I look at like, you were talking about police and fire being different, but you know, at least with with the city, it might be a little different with the state. But I know with the city when they when they bargain with police and fire, you know, you've got. Uh, People in the city government looking and saying, you know, we want to, we have to, this budget, we have to balance, and we don't want to raise taxes because it's going to be politically toxic. So there, that is a bargaining chip. It's not the same as a market-driven bargaining process, but there is that. I disagree. That. I think Louis, you said it. I actually disagree with the police and fire exception. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll go with Franklin Roosevelt, who said there's no place for collective bargaining uh, in the public sector. Period. Um, and we can demonstrate our, how we value police and fire by the way we reimburse them. I think the public will always show, uh, I don't think you have to worry too much of the public forgetting how important police and fire are. Now maybe we'll, maybe we'll devalue teachers. Maybe from time to time we will not appreciate what other people do. But um, I think we see right in front of us every day the importance of police and fire. Well, the reason the collective I... bargaining, as you said, there is no cost control when it's done in the public sector. Everybody at the table is more than willing to put more money forward. Well, the reason I am supportive of, of the police department collective bargaining is it's one thing to have laws, it's another thing to have order. And you have to pay your police officers well so you can maintain that order. Mexico's got lots of laws, they just don't have any order. And so law and order work together and you have to compensate those people well. It's a tough job and... Uh, but I don't think you would, I don't think the only way to compensate them is to give their unions the opportunity to negotiate benefit packages that the taxpayer can't afford. Well, can they not afford it? I mean, would we be better off with... Uh, with uh, when you have defined benefit plans instead of defined contribution plans, as you know as a business owner, mm -hmm. that's a prescription for runaway costs. That will get out of your control. Well, I mean, if we can create a, a, an environment where business can prosper, we can grow our economy so that we can have a larger pie and they get a big piece of that pie, that's fine. But we have to we have to do well on all our government policies. You can't be anti-smoking in bars and now we're not going to generate those tax dollars and, oh, we're going to pay these guys more, but we're going to handcuff small business because small business is synonymous to the middle class.
All right. Gang, are you ready for the lightning round of Gang of Four? Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Nikki, are you ready? Nikki's tweeting. All right, we're coming back with the lightning round. It's 11.25 on KTSA.